you would, take a moment and open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to begin our study this evening in Colossians chapter 3. Have you ever thought about the challenges that we face as a Christian? And I say that with a bit of reservation. Because sometimes we find challenges because we bring them on ourselves. But... Notice with me, if you would, in Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, we're going to go to Colossians chapter 3. And let's pick up there in chapter 3 with verse, start there with verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, he says, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Think about the challenge that we face. In verses 5 through 7, the Apostle Paul addressed some things which they had put off. All right, you think about this for just a moment there. He mentions fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. He says in verse 7 there, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But then he picks up with verse 8. And he lists a whole slew of other things we've got to work on. And this is kind of the, the challenge that I'm talking about. When you look at passages such as this, passages such as Ephesians chapter 4, and you think about 1 Peter uh, chapter 4 as well, you think about the passages here that lays out what we are not supposed to do and the passages that tell us what to do. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the works of the flesh, and then uh, 22 and 23, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. All of these things are telling us as Christians how we are to be living or not living, depending on how you want to look at it. But we, we live in, in a culture today that is, that is only different from times past because of our technological advances. In the end, there is no difference between the generation today and the generation 200 years ago. Sin is sin. Maybe certain sins are more prevalent now than they were in certain areas. But the fact of the matter is there's always sin and the temptation to sin. You know, the anger, the wrath, the malice, the filthy language out of your mouth, that's always been a challenge because that's the way the world is. And so we are tempted by the world to behave in that fashion. In a conversation earlier today, we are kind of talking about uh, the, 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 the merits or, or the worthlessness of the social networking media that we have going on today, such as Facebook, all right? If I could ask Dale to come out and, and say, Dale, give me five reasons why you don't like Facebook, and he'll give us 15. And we'll have to say, Dale, we're out of time. It's 8 o'clock. Can we move on, okay? And, you know, I could stand up here and tell you the benefits to it. But in the end, it's about how we behave ourselves. Whether it's with the modern-day technology of Facebook or we go back 300 years ago and we're writing to one another on this thing they used to call pen and paper, okay? How do we behave? How do we react? What do we say when we are in public? Whenever we are talking to people, and this is what we try to warn people about Facebook. You know, you think about in Ephesians and, and, and Colossians, will, Paul will also go on to say, let your speech be seasoned with salt. In Ephesians chapter 4, what we say needs to be with grace. Okay, we, 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 not, we should never say anything that we would regret or hate or, 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 or want to wish we'd never said that. The point is, as children of God, he establishes a standard for us. 
that should, if we live by it, never let us cross those lines. You know, he's telling brethren in Colossians chapter 3, you need to work a little bit harder. How you, hang, how you handle your anger, your wrath, and your malice, you need to get a handhold on this. The way you handle your feelings towards others and you speak bad about them or, or you use filthy language or maybe you even lie. He's telling them you've got to put these things away. And part of the reason goes back to the beginning of the chapter where he says, seek those things which are above, not things which are below. It's all about where we set our mindset. Being, if you would, as Paul says, spiritually minded. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. The scripture reading we, we had at the beginning of the service was Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Now, there's several things within this context which helps to remind us the way that we are supposed to live. And not just the way that we're supposed to live, but the reasons why we are supposed to live the way that we are supposed to live. Notice here beginning in chapter 8 there in verse 1. He begins in this section here. And by the way, what is interesting here is chapter 6 and 8 book in chapter 7. So if you ever want to study Romans chapter 7, which is a good study, make sure you keep chapter 6 and chapter 8 in place because it helps to better understand Paul's reasoning and his points he makes in chapter 7. But he says there in 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, notice that phrase there, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, it seems like a, like a simple phrase and concept. But how could a person not walk according to the flesh? I mean, we live in the flesh. We get up in the morning, we decide what clothes we put on. That's part of our fleshly choices. We're going to go to work in the morning, or we're going to go somewhere with our family, or we're going to go to school. What are we going to take for lunch? That's the big question that we all hate to answer is, what do you want for lunch today? I mean, it's just, just so, hard to, so hard to answer. But that's not what he's talking about when he has, says walk according to the flesh. What drives us? What is the motivation within our life? You know, in our Sunday morning Bible class, we were talking this morning about Samson. And you know, there's some evidence there that Samson was driven by some carnal desires there. You know, think about the women. He, first off, he wanted a woman of the Philistines, and, and he was this close to marrying her then lost his temper, and, and her father gave her to his best man. And then years later, he goes to a harlot in Giza. And then a little bit after that, in the Valley of Sorek, his heart is stolen by Delilah. There's a man thinking more fleshly. But we are told here in the text there that those who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh are not those who are going to be condemned. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because those who are in Christ Jesus walk not according to the flesh. But we make our decisions and, and, and our choices within life, and when we come to the crossroads of right and wrong, we make the decisions based on what the Spirit, the Word of God, dictates that we do. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus. Someone may ask, well, why, why is it this way? That if I live my life making only earthly choices and thinking only about carnal desires and temptations and giving in, why is it that that's going to yield condemnation? Well, it's because it's completely contrary to the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You know, this is why it's so important we talk about our outward behavior. We are living, we are supposed to be living our lives in such a way that we're no longer shackled to the ball and chain of sin. And our behavior, now that we've been set free from our bondage unto sin, is reflecting that of someone who is walking according to the spirit. But the practical application of it, brethren, this is where I think sometimes we have the greatest challenge. Being willing to recognize that this behavior is not fitting the person 
walking according to the Spirit. This word, this action, this desire is not fitting of one who's walking according to the Spirit. However, the one who is walking according to the Spirit will make this choice and that choice. You know, whether we're talking about social media or we're talking about behavior with other people or next-door neighbor, people we work with, or when we're in the privacy of our own homes, all of our choices and decisions will be made properly if we walk according to the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 3. He goes on, and, and there, here he's going to talk a little bit about the Mosaical law. He says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak to the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And we'll stop there for just a moment there. When he says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, I believe that's a reference to the Mosaic Law. When you go back and you study chapter 7, when Paul talks about the law and, and him not knowing something was sinful till he come to know the law and everything, I believe that's a look back to his life under the Mosaic Law. Some see it a little bit differently, but that's my understanding of it. And he says here in chapter 8 that the law could not resolve the issue of sin. You know, you think about that. Hebrews chapter 8 there when Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, is bringing in and trying to make the point about why the first covenant was done away with and why there was a need for a new covenant. And he, and he, and he goes through there and, and calls to mind the prophecy of Joel in Joel 31 and talking about how the Lord would make a new covenant with people. He says, and, and let's start over there for just a moment, Hebrews chapter 8. And put your markers at Romans 8. Um, hey, we'll be back there in a moment. But notice here in Hebrews chapter 8 what he says. Many times we look at the first part of verse 7, where Hebrews 8, verse 7. We look at the first part of verse 7 and overlook the first part of verse 8. Hebrews 8, verse 7 says, For, in that, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. And so the first covenant that God made with Israel on Mount Sinai had faults. But look what verse 8 says. Because finding fault with them, he says. The problem wasn't with the law that God gave them on Mount Sinai. The problem is they rejected that law. They chose not to honor that covenant that God had made with them. And they did it time and time again. The first generation died in the wilderness because they chose not to honor that covenant. Joshua's generation did honor the covenant. And about a generation after him. But then came a generation that didn't know Joshua, didn't know what the Lord had done. So they didn't keep the covenant. You know, and so it's just on and on and on and back and forth. So finally, through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, the Lord says, I'm bringing in a new covenant. Because these people have rejected the old. So he's going to be bringing in a new covenant. So that's my suggestion then. When he says there in verse 3 of Romans chapter 8, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, that's what he's talking about. The law was never given on Mount Sinai. The law was never given as an answer to sin the way the new covenant was. It was given to keep the people faithful unto God. And they, and, and they didn't do that. And so what did God do? Verse 3, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according, notice what it says now, to the Spirit. So in, in, in kind of in, in simpler terms, the point that he's making here is God sent Jesus to die upon the cross. He condemned sin in the flesh so that we would no longer walk in that sin. So that we would no longer walk in the ways of the world. There's a difference then between walking in the spirit and walking according to the flesh. Because when you walk according to the flesh, you make all your desires based on the fleshly desires. And that's all you're concerned with. I mean, why did Esau sell his birthright? Because he thought he was starving to death. <laughs> 
And his brother said, hey, I got a bowl of beans and lentils and stuff. You want some? And he said, sure, give me your birthright. No problem. I'm dying anyway, so what would it matter if I had my birthright? I'm dead anyway. So he, he sells it to him. And people think that way. When David looked, at, 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 when David looked over there and, and he saw, um, what's her name, Bathsheba there sitting on, on the rooftop, he thought with fleshly desires. You know when Samson saw Delilah? Fleshly desires. You know, you think about Judas. It, it, it is um, said, said that Judas was kind of a, a thief at heart. You know, he, he was covetous. Why? Because he thought with fleshly desires. You know, why, why didn't Ahab listen to, to Micaiah the prophet? Because he followed after fleshly desires. And we can give example after example after example. And so the point is, yes, we understand that we need to serve God from our heart. We understand that we can be defiled by the things that come from within, Mark chapter 7 says. But the point is, if our heart is right with God, and we are seeking to walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh, then the sin within our life will be done away with. That righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And I like the way he kind of words, at least in this translation here, that the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Because as Christians, that's the way we're supposed to be walking. Not all do. And we understand that even from study of the Scriptures. But anyway, let's go a little farther here with this one. He says down verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh, let's expand upon this a little bit more now. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. Remember what we started out with, Colossians chapter 3. Set your minds on things above, not on things below. But the individuals who walk according to the flesh, they set their minds on things that are below. He says in verse 5, But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. <clears throat> we ask ourselves, how many times a day do we pray? It's a valid question. And it needs a very good answer. Not an answer that we are happy with ourselves, but an answer that truly reflects that we pray daily to God. But we need to go beyond that. Ask ourselves, how often when we are given a choice to speak, do we seek to say something that would be a benefit to the person rather than something that would be worthless? See, this is how we make choices. I mean, how many times have you gone in, and some may be more picky than others, but how many times have you gone to the fresh fruit section of the grocery store and picked up something that's not fresh at all, or that's bruised? You kind of pick, some people are very picky. They'll go thumping cantaloupes and squeezing avocados, and you know, just and, and if, if they don't like it, they're not going to buy it. But my point is, why aren't we that picky with our own lives and our own behaviors? This is this is what the struggle is. If we're striving to live according to the flesh, then yes. We're going to be very particular about the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we see. Because we set our mind not on things below, but on things above. This is the point that Paul is trying to remind the brethren here of. For to be carnally minded is death, verse 6 says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. There's the two sides of the coin. It's either this or that. There's not a halfway point. There's not a halfway point within this. Either we live carnally minded and the end result is spiritual death, separation from God, or we live spiritually minded and in the end we have life and peace. Whose side are we on in all this? He, I mean, he, he makes it a point of contrast in the next verse there, doesn't he? Kind of like, who, whose side are you going to serve? Are you going to be on God's side or are you going to be on the other side? He says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Someone says, didn't God make the carnal mind? He made the body. He made the world. And yes, he made the desires that we have within the body. But he also created the brain that controls these desires. 
He created the part of us and gave us the right to say, no, I'm not going to do that, or yes, I'm going to do that. I mean, Adam and Eve, Eve, when she was sitting there, and the serpent was saying, hey, doesn't that fruit look good? And guess what? It'll make you like God. You'll know, you'll know right from wrong. Eve had a choice. She could have said, um, no, and walked away. But no, she chose to bite it. And then she gave it to her husband. And despite the stereotypes of husbands and wife relationships, Adam had the right to say to Eve, nope, not going to do it, dear. You're on your own. Could have thrown her under the bus, as the expression goes. But he didn't. He made the carnal choice to go along with his wife. And so at that point, in a manner of speaking, and he's speaking about Romans chapter 5 and all this, Adam became an enemy of God in a manner of speaking. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And under, understand the point there. Why is it that he says, well, why, what, how does this work? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Does it mean, therefore, then, that it's impossible for us to be saved? Absolutely. As long as we are living and thinking with the carnal mind. As long as I'm seeking after the things of the world, as long as I'm going after fleshly desires, as long as I'm going after self and all that self wants, I will never, ever be able to submit to the law of God. The carnal mind can't do that. Because the carnal mind, by the sheer definition within the text, is opposed to God. But if we choose to think with the spiritual mind, if we choose to think spiritually minded, then yes, there is life and peace. And we're not an enemy of God. As a matter of fact, we are in fellowship with God. How many times have we talked about that? John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. You know, if anyone says that he's in fellowship with God and walks in darkness... John says he lies and the truth is not in him. But if a person walks in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Brethren, this is what he means when he says being spiritually minded. This is what he's talking about here. This is not the enmity against God. This is working together with God. Verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. This is how we live our lives if we are going to be the children that God would have us to be. We set our minds on things above. We walk according to the Spirit. We make our decisions based upon the Word of God and what God desires of us from His Word. And we're not driven by the fleshly desires. We can exercise control. Look at verse 10. Two more verses and the last one will be yours. And if Christ is in you, now think about this for a moment. Look at verse 9. But if you were not in the flesh but in the Spirit... If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. All right, then notice what he says. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the Spirit dwelling in you, Christ dwelling in you, he says the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of, of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Well, now let's look at the third part he brought into this equation. We have here in verse 9, the Spirit dwelling in us. We have in verse 10, Christ dwelling in us. And then verse 11, but if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, well, God raised Jesus from the dead, so the Spirit of the Lord dwelling within us. He says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. It's this fact that as Christians we have to understand when we become a Christian, we talk about individuals being made alive. Paul, in his letter to the church in Ephesus, um, I believe it's Ephesians chapter 2 or chapter 4, uh, talks about us being made alive in Christ Jesus. 
because we're once spiritually dead, separated from him. But brethren, if we're going to stand up and say, yes, on this day in the past, I was baptized into Jesus Christ. I arose to walk in the newness of life. Let us ask ourselves a question. Does our behavior, does our mindset reflect that change? It should, obviously. It should. So my admonition to all of us, when we go about our daily lives, whether it be here where it's very easy to be godly because of who we're around, or we have to go to our jobs, which again, my job, I'm still around good people. You may not be, but. Or you go with your friends or your family members. And in all the decisions you have to make, ask yourself with every decision, is this the decision that a child of God should make or am I about to step into sin? Those who are seeking the things that are above are going to make decisions in accordance to the will of God, to that which is right, to that which is wrong. And they're going to seek not to be defiled by the things that come from within, but instead have that which flows from within, that which is pleasing unto God, that which loves God, that which reflects the light of Christ within our lives. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one tonight. As Paul pointed out, Christ came and died upon the cross so that you could be saved. He sent a great opportunity for you. Will you take that opportunity and become one of God's children tonight? If you believe that Christ is a son of God, a belief strong enough to turn away from sin within your life, then obey his command tonight to be baptized and you will rise up to walk in the newness of life. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. Go back and look at the text again. Look at what has been done for you. Look at the simple definition of walking according to the flesh and walking according to the spirit and acknowledge the error within your life if it is there and then make the repentant change and turn back tonight. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.